Welcome back to another episode of Making Fun. I want to share something with you guys today. This is my childhood blanket. Its name is Gich, which is little kid for blanket when you can't speak yet. I carried this blanket with me absolutely everywhere. I slept with it every night. I stuck this corner up my nose so many times, and I had this blanket by my side for a very, very long time, way longer than I'm willing to share with you here. And I still have it to this day because this blanket has meaning in my life. This blanket is a part of me and it is faded and has giant holes in it now, but I still like to take it out every once in a while and just reminisce. I also have this scarf right here that Tia made for me. Now I love this scarf not just because it is a Doctor Who scarf, but also because it's something that she took the time and energy to knit for me. And again with this scarf right here that my mother made for me. So Tia and I decided to make Pip a blanket. But as Carl Sagan said, if you wish to make an apple pie from scratch, you must first invent the universe. So before I can make Pip a blanket, we're going to make a loom. I began by selecting the lumber I would use to build the frame of the loom. I wanted to use something really robust, so I picked this white oak I had laying around for a while. I prepare the lumber by cutting it down to size and then feeding it through the planer. The first thing I decided to tackle was the warp bead. These are two octagonal dowels that hold the vertical cords in place while you run the horizontal cords back and forth. I had to glue two pieces together to get the correct diameter and then clamp them in place. After a night of drying, I released the boards from the clamp and then cut them down on the table saw. After some complicated maths, I figured out exactly how much material I needed to remove from the board to make it into an octagon. Next, I begin preparing the boards for the frame. I found the instructions for this loom on instructables.com, where they had all of the schematics as well as the STL files for the parts that I needed to print on my 3D printer. I trace out the right and left side of the loom onto my wood, and then between the two sides, I drilled a series of relief holes so that when I came in with my bandsaw, I could turn at sharper angles. Once the two pieces were separate, I taped them together so that when I ran them back through the bandsaw, I would be sure that they were cut exactly the same on the right side and the left side. Okay, um, now we need to do some brass band. Make this look pretty. Many of my builds are primarily functional, but for this I wanted to take extra care 
and pay close attention to all the details to make it as pretty as I possibly could. Cool. I put down a sacrificial board on my drill press before I drilled out the hole for the warp bead. The sacrificial board prevents the drill bit from blowing out the wood on the back side of it as it exits the oak. Next I move on to assembling the cone. It's important that this is very strong and sturdy and straight as it does most of the movement during the looming process. I 3D printed each one of these pieces, and the files are available free to download on instructables.com. I had a little difficulty getting the comb pieces in, but with the help of my hammer, I learned my lesson. And then promptly forgot the lesson. Next, I am preparing the cross beams, which will hold my right and left sides in place. For added rigidity, I decided to embed my crosscut beams into the sides. I used the kerf of the blade to cut out a dado. When doing this method, it's always better to err on the side of too tight so you can slowly sneak up on it and get the piece to fit perfectly. It's always an exciting part of a build when you see it start to take shape and all the pieces are fitting together. After making the warp beam, I was left with an octagonal peg and a round hole. Quickly frustrated with how long the rasping was going to take, I decided to move to the table saw. I set up a stop block at the exact length that I wanted to cut out, and then moving horizontally on my crosscut sled, I managed to remove the material, and then finish it up with the Shinto rasp. So I've cut out this piece right here and temporarily put it in place using this clamp. And this piece is the part that allows me to move the comb up and set it on top of this shelf and down, putting it the base on the bottom of this shelf. And that's what causes the up and down action. I'm pretty excited about this. I think that this is gonna work really, really well. I'm happy with the choices that I made with the lumber. It is a little bit heavy making it out of oak, but my goodness, it uh, is going to be strong and stable. Polyurethane is a really nice way to extend the life of your project by sealing your wood.
Here I am cutting out the two boards that attach the warp beam to the fabric. I drilled a series of holes into the board and matching holes into the warp beam. This allows you to tie a piece of string between the warp beam and the board so that you can attach your warp thread. Each of the couplings and the gears needed to be drilled out and bolted in to the warp beam. It worked! That's one, now we'll do it to the other one. I decided that I wanted to be able to take the whole thing apart, so I inserted a threaded metal bracket. This allows me to temporarily bolt the cross beams in place while it is in use, but makes it very easy to disassemble and store while not being used. While the instructions did supply the STL files for the 3D printed gears, it didn't explain how to attach the gears or make the ratcheting system. So I came up with this system on my own. Okay. I could watch this part all day long. Here I'm beginning assembly on the two shuttles that will go back and forth carrying the weft cord. I cut the two pieces in half and then taped them together so that when I ran them through the bandsaw, they would be exact copies of each other. surface you are using, whether it is a heddle loom like this or a frame loom like I used in the Baker Street video to make my tiny rug. The weft is the fibers that you are weaving in and out of your warp that make it into fabric. Now that the loom is complete, we can begin stringing the warp thread through the comb and onto the warp beam. At this point, the warp thread has been strung, but it's still actually one long thread that has just been woven in and out of the comb. So we tie all of the warp threads together, remove it from the peg, and then cut them all into their own individual strands. We're now ready to load the warp onto the beam. As I rotate the warp, I insert a piece of paper between each layer of the warp thread while Tia held the tension. The layers of paper help prevent the warp thread from losing tension while it is wrapped on the warp beam. Now we load every other warp thread through the eye hole. This way, when you move the comb up, every other thread will move up, while the remaining cords will stay in the same place.
After that, you can tie off your ends. And then string your warp to the beam. Here you can see as I lift the comb, every other warp thread is raised while the remaining threads stay in place. So the objects in our life that have the greatest meaning are the ones that can't be replaced. And this is because they come with a story, usually either something that you did with the object or where the object came from. And in this case, these objects connect me to my childhood and my family. The more we surround ourselves with objects like these, the more we are connected with where we came from and connected and grounded in our life right here in this present moment. So since we know this, we can be intentional about the objects that we surround ourselves with. And we can bring greater meaning to our lives by bringing objects into our lives that have a story behind them. These stories that we tell ourselves about who we are and where we came from have a dramatic impact on how we feel about ourselves and where we came from. And a great thing is, is that we can share this with the people that we care about by giving them an object that also comes with a story. That way you're literally weaving yourself into the stories that they tell themselves about who they are and the meaning behind their life. Remember the blanket that TT was making? Well, here it is. What do you think about this blanket? Do you like it? So you would like Papa and TT to make you a blanket for your bed? Yeah. What colors would you like your blanket to be? I want this red and black. Red and black? Yeah. Let's see if we can find some red and black yarn, okay? All right, I love you. Love you. I love you. I want to give something to my son that gives meaning to his life and will hopefully connect me to the story that he tells himself about who he is and what kind of person he will become. While I do believe that we can bring a greater meaning to our life this way, it is a fundamental truth of this universe that everything is changing and everything is impermanent. So if we hold on to our objects and our stories too tightly, as they fade away, we will suffer. But if we can have a balanced approach, with one foot in the world of making meaning and another foot in the world of understanding the nature of impermanence and change, we can straddle both of these worlds, and we can experience the best that both of these worlds have to offer. Moreover, by understanding that these objects will decay and fade and unravel, it makes me appreciate the object that much more right here and right now. And right now is always the best time to live your life. Thank you so much for watching. Please consider subscribing. We're weaving. <laughs> Let's begin. Hey, Taj. What's your opinion on looms? Yeah. Well, I'm excited, even if you're not. does the thing like this and then like this it works it works that was
was not in the instructions. Rude. Let's slip the dogs of war. Man. Man.